Hello and welcome to our webcast. Today's topic will be hydronic heating coils for terminal units. My name is Randy Zimmerman and I'll be presenting today's program. Later I'll be joined by David Pick and Weber Wu for questions and answers. David is our director of HVAC technology and comes to Titus with over 17 years of project experience as a consulting engineer. Weber is our terminal unit product manager. You may submit your questions at any time and we will answer them for the benefit of all at the conclusion of our program. In today's webcast, we'll look at how hydronic heating coils are typically constructed. We'll look at how their construction affects operating limits and how applications are affected by circuitry. We'll also look at glycol additives, get some pointers about schedules, and provide some advice on problems to avoid when making coil selections. Most terminal unit coils are constructed similarly regardless of manufacturer. The standard design in our industry uses aluminum rippled fins that are typically .0045 inches thick with a standard spacing of 10 fins per inch. The internal circuit tubes are made from copper and measure half inch OD with a .016 inch thick tube wall. The fin pack is generally housed in a casing made from 18 or 20 gauge galvanized steel. The standard connection sizes are typically half inch, 5 8 inch, or 7 8 inch OD male solder. To ensure watertight construction, most manufacturers leak test by subjecting each coil to as much as 500 psi of air pressure while submerged in a water tank. This typical standard construction results in a coil that has a maximum recommended working pressure of 360 psi. This is based on a bursting pressure of 1800 psi with a safety factor of 5. It is standard convention for manufacturers to label water coils for a maximum water temperature of 200 degrees Fahrenheit. This is done mainly to differentiate a water coil from a steam coil. Steam coils are circuited differently and should use tube walls that are at least .025 inches thick to prevent possible failure due to etching. Generally speaking, water coils should not be used to handle steam. The thickness of the circuit tube wall in a water coil has only a minor effect on heat transfer, but thicker walls may be specified in order to increase the maximum recommended working pressure of a coil. A tube wall that's .025 inches thick increases the maximum working pressure to 500 psi and a .035 inch tube wall increases it to 850 psi. These thicker tube walls would result in bursting pressures of 2500 and 4250 psi respectively. This extra copper can significantly increase the cost of a coil, so thicker tube walls should only be specified when absolutely necessary. One row and two row coils typically use cross flow circuitry. In this type of configuration, the circuit tubes are in the same vertical plane. This configuration results in a coil that can be rotated 180 degrees to reverse the location of the plumbing connections with no change in coil performance. Here you see an application that puts the coil connection on the right hand side. Here you see the same coil rotated 180 degrees to put the connections on the left hand side. This configuration also provides the same performance regardless of the direction of airflow. Cross-flow circuitry is a good choice for small coils for these reasons as well as the fact that manufacturers and distributors can stock half as many coils in their warehouses to cover most common applications. When coils get larger requiring three or four rows, it makes sense to take advantage of the increased depth by using counterflow circuitry. In counterflow heating coils, the warmest water is put in contact with the warmest air. This increases the heat transfer efficiency of the coil. So in a counterflow coil, hot water enters the coil circuits closest to the discharge of the coil. When counterflow coils are used, it is critical to have the air passing through the coil in the correct direction in order to get the benefit of the circuitry. If the air isn't traveling in the right direction, the heat capacity will be reduced. Now I don't mean to belittle plumbing contractors, 
By and large, they know what they're doing. At the very least, I'm sure they know more about plumbing than me. But it's funny how people sometimes latch on to certain bits of knowledge while totally ignoring others. All plumbers should know that water coils are always supplied from the lowest connection. This is necessary to prevent air from being trapped in the coil circuitry as the heating valve opens and closes. Steam coils are the opposite. They're supplied from the top. In my experience, most plumbing contractors know all about counterflow circuitry, but they sometimes incorrectly assume that all coils are circuited in this manner. They sometimes take the time to examine the piping U-bends on the side plates of the coil and then check to make sure that the water supply line goes towards the rear of the coil. If it doesn't, they may proceed to flip the coil around or simply report that they received the wrong coil. Unfortunately, sometimes the header pipe arrangements and manifold piping add to the confusion and then a two-row coil gets mistaken for a counterflow coil. The absolute worst mistake that a plumber can make is to supply water to the uppermost connection in order to make it counterflow. This is truly overthinking the situation and usually the result of confusion regarding the header arrangements. In short, any increased efficiency to be gained by counterflow circuitry would be more than offset by the potential for air locking of the coil. While the standard coil designs in our industry were developed for 180 degree entering water, that's becoming much less common in new construction and building retrofit. Today's condensing boilers operate most efficiently around 110 to 120 degrees depending on who you ask. We also see geothermal sources being used to provide some limited heat. In order to cope with the reduced supply water temperature, something has to give. In many cases, this means more coil rows and the associated air pressure losses. Some manufacturers are offering so-called high capacity coils. These coils typically use conventional construction, but simply reduce the fin spacing from 10 fins per inch to 12 fins per inch. This doesn't make a huge difference, but it may allow a 12 fin per inch two row coil to be used instead of a 10 fin per inch three row coil. And that can make a big difference to the designer. Another change in heating fluids involves glycol. While ethylene glycol was once widely used as an antifreeze additive in water systems, propylene glycol is currently favored because it is more environmentally friendly. It's important to understand that no matter which glycol is being used, the purpose of glycol isn't to increase the efficiency of the system. It is strictly used as antifreeze. If a building is located in a climate where freezing isn't an issue, it's more efficient to run 100% water. As you might expect, ethylene glycol was more effective than propylene glycol, but it was environmentally unfriendly. It was therefore largely replaced by propylene. Unfortunately, it takes a higher concentration of propylene glycol to get the same result. Since propylene glycol increases the viscosity of water, it also increases the head losses and the pump energy required to run the system. In other words, no one should be surprised to see reduced performance when glycol concentrations are applied. The required heat capacity of a coil is usually specified in terms of MBH or thousands of BTUs per hour. Sometimes schedules simply provide the heating CFM and leaving air temperature. This is related to MBH and the entering air temperature by the following equation. Leaving air temperature equals entering air temperature plus 927 times the MBH divided by the CFM. So what kind of leaving air temperature should we be looking for? According to ASHRAE, for heating from overhead diffusers, the leaving air temperature shouldn't be more than 15 degrees Fahrenheit higher than the desired room temperature. This is recommended to limit temperature stratification and increase room air mixing for improved thermal comfort. It should be pointed out that overhead slot diffusers covering perimeter glass generally work better at lower leaving air temperatures. For this type of application, discharge temperatures in a range of 83 to 85 degrees will provide better glass coverage. As a person who provides technical support for a wide range of products, I probably spend more time helping customers with water coil selections than anything else. 
It's really not that hard if you understand a few simple facts. Although you may have a choice of one row, two row, three row, or four row coil, most people don't want more than two rows. So now you've simplified your choices down to one row or a two row coil. Equipment schedules often provide too much information. What I mean is the schedules tend to fill in all the blanks without allowing anything to float. If they provide the entering water, leaving water, entering air, leaving air, MBH, GPM, and air pressure drop, they filled in all the blanks. Although it's possible to meet these very exacting requirements, it would likely require designing a custom coil for each line of the schedule. There are manufacturers that specialize in this, but it comes at great cost. Terminal unit manufacturers have standard coil designs that deliver a standard range of coil performance at the lowest possible cost. That's why it usually makes sense to decide what's most important to you and let the other things float. When I'm asked to match a schedule, I tend to look at the entering water and the entering air and then try to meet or exceed the MBH or leaving air without exceeding the maximum GPM. While I tend to avoid excessive water temperature drops, I've always felt that the leaving water temperature has to be the least important parameter. After all, who really knows what the leaving water will be as the coils modulate around the building and the return water mixes and makes its way back to the boiler? It seems rather pointless to specify. One issue that deserves discussion involves the effect of low water velocity on coil capacity. Most coil selection programs are extremely flexible with regard to the input parameters, but they do not always warn users about low water velocity. The heat transfer equations used in our industry assume turbulent water flow through the coil circuits. Although turbulence has many bad connotations with regard to air distribution, in the case of water coil performance, turbulence is a very good thing. In a turbulent fluid stream, the water bounces off the sides of the circuit tubes and thoroughly mixes inside the coil. When water moves too slowly through a pipe, it can flow in a more laminar fashion. When this occurs, water in the center of the fluid stream never contacts the circuit tube walls. This can greatly reduce the heat transfer. So how do we define the difference between fast enough and too slow? In fluid mechanics, there's a dimensionless quantity known as the Reynolds number. It was developed in the late 1800s by its namesake, Osborne Reynolds. It was his life's work to study fluid flow in pipes in order to determine when flow changed between turbulent, transitional, and laminar flow. The Reynolds number is basically a ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces that quantifies the relative importance of these two forces for any given flow conditions. Laminar flow occurs when the Reynolds number is low and is characterized by smooth, constant fluid motion. Turbulent flow occurs when the Reynolds number is high, resulting in chaotic eddies, vortices, and instable flow. So that's a bit of a history lesson, but we still haven't defined the difference between fast and slow moving fluids. If we know all of the properties of a fluid stream such as velocity, density, dynamic viscosity, and kinematic viscosity for a given internal pipe dimension, we can calculate the Reynolds number. For fluid flow through a pipe, turbulent flow generally occurs with a Reynolds number greater than 10,000. Laminar flow is said to occur with a Reynolds number less than 2300. So what about the Reynolds numbers from 2300 to 10,000? Well that's called transitional flow. Many of the selections we make regarding water coils fall into that transitional type of flow. There's nothing wrong with the upper portion of the transitional flow range. The coefficient of heat transfer stays relatively constant. As you drop down to a Reynolds number less than 5,000, this is where the problems begin. 
First of all, the coefficient of heat transfer starts to slowly drop, then it suddenly falls. The point at which this happens is almost impossible to predict because it depends on the surface effects of the copper tubing. Rather than calculate an actual Reynolds number, there's a rule of thumb for minimum water velocities. Safe to say the best thing to do is to stay well above the lower transitional range. To stay out of trouble, it's a good idea to maintain at least 0.82 feet per second velocity through the coil circuit tubes. This corresponds to roughly half a GPM per coil circuit. Although the number of circuits in a coil can vary between manufacturers, this information should be readily available. The number of rows and size of a coil will determine the number of circuits it contains. Hopefully we've covered all that we meant to cover. Hydronic coils aren't difficult to apply if you understand the operating limits and circuitry. A few quick takeaways should include the following. Always supply water to the lowest connection. Don't assume that all coils are counterflow circuited. Don't be surprised when glycol reduces heat capacity. Keep your water velocities up. Use the fewest possible number of rows. Avoid excessive discharge temperatures. And last but not least, simplify your selections by deciding what's most important. That concludes our program today. We want to thank you for spending this time with us and hope that this material will benefit you in your professional endeavors. We will continue to produce more programs covering other HVAC topics and hope that you'll join us. Our panel will now begin answering questions that came in during the program. If you have any questions, please enter them in the box on the right side of your screen. Thank you and have a great day.